role as a teacher here in the Book of First Nephi. Well said. Yeah. Let's talk about another um, another take that grows in some ways out of Grant Hardy's method. This is Joe Spencer, Joseph Spencer's brief theological introduction to the book of First Nephi, which was published by the Maxwell Institute in 2020 as part of a whole series of brief theological introductions to each book in the Book of Mormon. Joe um, is very much in the mold of Hardy in the sense that he is a reader who starts from the inside out rather than an outside in approach to the Book of Mormon. So he, um, there's probably never been a reader of the Book of Mormon who um, can more closely um, parse everything from word choice to punctuation choice at the micro level to things like large structures that organize big blocks of content throughout the Book of Mormon. Um, he's incredibly sharp at reading at the at the micro level and the macro level. Um, and by really focusing on what is there inside the covers of the Book of Mormon, he's um, been able to um, find all sorts of remarkable um, discoveries in the book. In our last episode, listeners will remember um, that Kim Matheson shared with us um, Joe Spencer's understanding of the structure of First Nephi. And it, it appears to be actually very, very carefully structured in two parts. You can go back and um, and review that episode if you're interested in that. I wanted to focus here just for a minute on Joe's reading of um, the slaying of Laban. This is a powerful, often problematic, but crucially important episode right here at the very beginning of the Book of Mormon. And it has been the occasion for much, much very careful work, trying to work through the ethics, the um, the theology, um, the political meaning, and the cultural meaning of the moment when Nephi slays Laban to obtain the brass plates. Um, no doubt our listeners are familiar with the basics of that of that episode, so I won't necessarily review those basics, but I'll share with you uh, Joe's reading, which I find compelling, and then Jasmine, you can tell me what you think. Um, first of all, the At the largest level, um, this episode shows the crucial importance, the urgent importance of Scripture. Without the brass plates, without the prophecies of Isaiah and Zenos and Zenoch, the Nephites would not be able to keep the commandments of the Lord. And and this is the... um, the foundation of their relation, their covenant relationship with God is their ability to worship him through keeping the commandments. So at, at the broadest level, um, this episode shows us how crucial it was for, for um, the family of Lehi to obtain the brass plates. But specifically, how can we make ethical sense of this moment when Nephi slays Laban? Well, one possibility um, is that this is a kind of Abrahamic test where In the moment of direct command by God, your religious and covenant duty to God exceeds any other kind of ethical obligation. So just as at the moment that Abraham is ready and on the point of slaying Isaac, his obedience and faith in in his relationship with the Lord overcomes and sets aside for a moment the ethical, the abundant ethical qualms of of sacrificing your own child. And in the same way, perhaps we can read um, Nephi's experience as a kind of Abraham experience where um, the religious command exceeds the, the ethical demand in that moment. But Joe has actually a different reading than that. Um, and he points out something very important. In chapter two, Nephi is given two conditional promises. One is a group promise. And this promise is that if as a family, as a group, you keep the commandments, you will all together prosper in the land of promise. And the second commandment is a personal commandment. It's to Nephi himself. And it's that Nephi, if you yourself keep the commandments, you will be made a ruler and a teacher over your brothers. That's in verse 22 of chapter 2. 
So right after receiving these two promises from the Lord, um, Lehi sends his sons on this quest back to Jerusalem to obtain the place. And Nephi sees this as his moment to prove his obedience. He is going to prove that he will keep the commandments. And so he is going to be made a ruler and a teacher over his brothers. This is his moment to make that happen. So he starts to focus specifically on the promise that was given to him. Joe reads Nephi's performance on this plate's quest as actually rather disastrous in certain ways. Um, Nephi's first plan fails where, you know, he suggests that they, that they go and get the rich, their, their riches from the land of inheritance and try to buy the plates from Laban. Um, that fails. Nephi then fails um, to convince his brothers on his own um, that they should keep on going. It takes an angel who comes to get them back in line. Um, but Joe sees the arrival of this angel as a kind of turning point. At that point, Nephi realizes my own efforts to make this happen, to succeed on this quest, aren't enough on my own. My plan hasn't worked. And now we read in chapter four, verse six, Nephi is led by the spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. So he's a bit humbler. And in this more humble and open state, he comes across Laban, lying drunk and passed out in the street. And the spirit at that point constrains we're told it's very interesting. He's, he's not commanded to kill Laban, but he's constrained. The spirit constrains him um, to kill Laban. In that conversation with the spirit, there is this very famous moment where um, the spirit says something like this. It's better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. And on the surface, it can seem like this is a sort of utilitarian rationale. That the spirit is saying, well, you know, there's a greater good here. So in the moment, you know, we can, um, it, it's ethically um, expedient and, it, it, you know, it's okay that this one man should perish. But Joe has a very different reading of that moment. He sees, and I find this to be very persuasive, that in that moment, when the spirit says, it's better that one man should perish than that an entire nation should dwindle in unbelief. That serves to remind Nephi of the first obedience promise given in chapter two, the one that applied to the whole people. And it helps Nephi realize that what matters most in this moment is the welfare of his entire people, not just his own status in relation to his own brothers. And so with that in mind and seeing, as we've already mentioned, the crucial importance for his people of obtaining the brass plate so that they could have the, the messianic prophecies. Um, in that moment, Nephi sees what he has to do and for the good of his people, not for his own personal um, status, he, he slays Laban. So the, his bottom line is that the Laban episode has to be read in the context of Nephi's own maturing faith and trust in God. He needs to get over his own ambition, think about what is better for the people as a whole. So we can see this as a part of um, what in literary studies we would call a building's roman. That's a type of narrative um, that shows the spiritual education and maturation of the protagonist. Um, and here we see the moment when Nephi realizes that the communal and the covenantal needs to come above the individual. So what do you think about that? What do you think about Joe's reading of this moment? I think it's very interesting. I wish I had a very profound take on the slaying of Laban because it is definitely an ethical question that a lot of people have. Um, I'm a fairly agnostic on the various different takes. I haven't been completely sold on any specific one, but I think many of them have very good things to contribute to the conversation of, you know, why did Nephi have to kill someone? Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention John W. Welch's article on this, the legality of the slaying of Laban, which Joe does mention in his book, Yeah. Um, where when Nephi's about to kill Laban, the spirit constrains him and says, I've delivered you into, or I've, God has delivered Laban into your hands, essentially, which is an allusion and quotation of an Exodus passage that is discussing the legality of when it is permissible to take a life, which is A, the... Um, 
that God has delivered the person into your hands and B, it's not premeditated. And Nephi makes very clear to state that I did not know what I was doing beforehand. I was being led by the spirit. And so you've got a couple instances that can show that at least in the law of Moses, in Nephi's worldview, it was legally permissible. Now, obviously the question of legality is very different than the ethical question of, is it right or is it good or is it ethical? So um, what Joe does here is bring up a lot of interesting possibilities. He presents several different solutions that people have brought over the years. Um, One that I find really interesting is what Don Bradley comes to the table with in his book, The Lost 116 Pages. And it is speculative in nature uh, because it's relying on certain, uh, you know, second or late secondhand or late sources um, that potentially hint at the idea that this episode is taking place at Passover Mm. in Lehi's milieu. But I think that setting is really attractive um, from a typological standpoint. It all of a sudden frames this story as a Nephi's, like you said, kind of coming of age, maturation, um, but it's setting it in a very Exodus specific setting as well, where you've got different parallels to the murmuring Israelites, the wanderings in the wilderness. And then you've got Laban, which is kind of taking the role of the great Pharaoh who is refusing to let my people, or in this case, the plates go. And then Laban also takes this double role of being this uh, sacrificial firstborn Egyptian in the biblical narrative. Mm. uh, God's final plague is killing the firstborn Egyptian of every single home, except the Israelites who had painted the blood above the door uh, lintels. And so here you've got Laban being delivered into Nephi's hands. And through his sacrifice, we're now allowing Nephi's people to go to abscond to the promised land and to take their religion with them to take the brass plates to be able to have that record. So um, I like that typological casting a lot, I think it paints an interesting picture of not just Nephi's development, but also God's big picture, what he's trying to do with this people. This is new Israel trying to establish themselves. And in order for that to happen, this needs to happen as hard as it is. And as you mentioned, there's also maybe Abrahamic overtones Mm -hmm. to doing something very ethically difficult, but something that God commands. So Like I said, I don't have any particular strong feelings of how we want to resolve this issue, but I know it's one that people struggle with. And um, I think there are multiple ways we can approach it to come to some understanding of what might be going on here. And certainly uh, Joseph Spencer's is a really compelling one. Yeah. You know, this issue of typology um, is really important and it's something, it's so evident in the book of First Nephi where the story of the Exodus um, is pervasive, both explicitly and implicitly in the story of the Lehite family leaving Jerusalem journeying through the wilderness and entering a land of promise. There's also strong typological overtones with the story of Joseph, Um, Joseph who leads his family ironically into Egypt and the the sibling rivalry um, and and violence that occurs there. Um, Talk to us a little bit about ways that scholars have made sense of biblical typology in the book of First Nephi. Well, from what I've gathered, we've got basically, you've mentioned several of them, three major uh, biblical figures that Nephi gets compared to in this book. We've got the Exodus, which you see all throughout the whole book of First Nephi. Um, I mentioned a little bit with how Don Bradley's explored the Exodus setting of the Laban episode. But as they're traveling through Arabia and they're trying to go to the promised land, you see over and over these motifs of wandering in the wilderness, God's deliverance. You even have God appearing as a pillar of fire in chapter one. And you've got, um, you know, the parting of the sea more metaphorically here. Uh, God is able to help Nephi find a way to cross the sea, whereas with Moses, he was more miraculously parting the sea. And um, over and over, you see these little motifs where it seems that Nephi is trying to make connections there to say that, as I mentioned, that this is new Israel. Um, God is preserving this remnant of the house of Israel and going to bring them to a promised land to fulfill his purposes. And so he is trying to find significance and meaning by drawing back to these older archetypal stories of his own religious background, Um, crossing the sea, the pillar of fire, wanderings in the wilderness, murmurings in the wilderness over and over and over. Um, 
and miraculous objects even, where you've had the manna in the wilderness or the quail in the wilderness. And here we've got a Liahona that just shows up outside of Lehi's tent. And uh, even things like Lehi's vision with the iron rod and um, miraculous objects that can help navigate and get them to where they need to go. Um, but you also have uh, scholars who have talked about other things, like you mentioned Joseph, comparing Nephi to Joseph, because um, uh, I know Benjamin McGuire touched on this a little bit, because Nephi is this very precocious um, younger sibling who ends up taking over rulership and hegemony over the family in several ways. And Joseph of Egypt, he had a lot of, um, well, he was certainly precocious and he had a lot of presumption uh, to rule over his brothers that his brothers did not appreciate. And that caused a lot of conflict, rift, struggles in Egypt um, that eventually came to a redemption cycle. And you see a lot of those same parallels with Nephi, who is this younger, precocious, maybe presumptuous younger brother who wants to prove himself to the Lord and prove himself to his brothers and grows and matures and eventually does become all that he said he would be. It's a little tragic though, that Joseph kind of gets his happy ending where he gets his reunion with his family, his reconciliation with his brothers. That's very touching. And Nephi never gets that. And it's a very tragic thing that he very is it's very conscious of as he's writing his narrative because he's writing 30 years after the fact after he's already split but not just that after he's had a panoramic vision in first nephi chapters 11 to 15 ish where he's shown the history of the world and the future of the world and the history of his people and not only does he see that his family is going to rift but that ultimately they're going to be destroyed and so it's it's touching and it's heartrending to see Nephi's fingerprints all over his narrative, comparing himself to Joseph, but knowing at the end of the day that he falls short of that happy ending that Joseph had. Mm -hmm. um, but then in addition, you also have some comparisons to David and Goliath a little bit. Now, it's a little tricky because in the Book of Mormon, the Nephites don't seem to have a terribly high opinion of King David and King Solomon. We see elsewhere that they have a lot of criticisms of them. But at least in this initial narrative in the slaying of Laban, you've got a little bit of a parallel going on between Nephi slaying Laban and David killing Goliath. You've got the underdog slaying the mighty captain of at least 50 soldiers in Laban's case, uh, and who against all odds miraculously is able to prevail and demonstrate that he is chosen of God. He's the anointed one, if you will. Um, but like I said, later on, there's also uh, some polemic against this Davidic um, ideology about Jerusalem, about Israel, about kingship. And essentially the Nephites kind of say that, yeah, David and uh, Solomon, they certainly had the right to Israelite kingship, but they also were really wicked. We as new Israel are going to, you know, keep the commandments and prosper in the land. And they really take that to heart. So those are some things that we've seen from scholars um, trying to compare Nephi to and his plates to from a typological perspective, trying to see vast patterns in the text that harken back to biblical narratives to try to draw new connections, new meaning and new symbolism that can help, you know, bring the Book of Mormon's messages and stories uh, closer to home. Yeah. Yeah. There's two things there that I, that I want to pick up on. Um, first is what you just touched on, that this leads us towards another large category of Book of Mormon scholarship. And we might call that intertextual, or sometimes we might call it canonical scholarship. This is work that takes the Book of Mormon and sets it side by side with the Bible and finds the resonances between the two books. And they are manifold, just as you have, have shown between the Old Testament in the Book of Mormon through typology, through moments of ritual, through the law of Moses, um, and through, through narrative resonances, um, through linguistic poetic um, devices such as chiasmus, um, and also the, the New Testament, because the Book, the book of Mormon, of course, is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it stands to reason that we're going to see all sorts of echoes and theological resonances of Christianity um, as it was um, instituted and developed in the old world and as it was instituted and developed in the new world. So this is, this is a whole other sort of bucket of scholarship that is very, very rich. And we'll, we'll get back to this, especially in second Nephi when we, when we tackle um, Isaiah for real. 
the second thing that I wanted to pick up on what you just said um, is something that has really struck me this time through reading the book of First Nephi, and that is what a very sad story it is. Um, I think in the past I've been too, I don't know, too quick maybe to focus on kind of the triumphant young Nephi, whether in celebrating that or maybe whether in looking at that critically. I, I think I haven't paid enough attention to the older Nephi behind the text, the older Nephi who's writing this text, the older and sadder Nephi who came to his place of sadness through great courage. There's this moment that Grant Hardy highlights that has really st stuck with me. It's in it's in 1 Nephi 11, where um, Nephi has asked the Lord to, has told the Lord that he wants to understand the things that his father saw in the dream. So the spirit comes to him and, and, and says, are you really sure that you want this? Are you really sure that you want to understand? Um, what is it that you desire, Nephi? And Nephi answers, I desire to know the interpretation thereof. He wants to know. And in that moment, he is like Eve, who is willing to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the fruit of that knowledge was bitter. In many cases, Nephi saw that his family would split. He saw that he would never truly and adequately become the loving ruler and teacher over his brothers that he wanted to be for their good. He saw that his own people would ultimately be destroyed by the descendants of his brothers. Of course, there were wonderful views as well. He saw the coming of Jesus Christ and he understood uh, the redemption. He saw the coming of Christ to minister to his people. So there were, of course, moments of light and joy. But in the end, um, Nephi is a somewhat isolated um, figure. He loves Jewish prophecies. He loves Jewish exegesis. He loves the ways of his people. And he's now in a new world where he tells us he's the only one who knows how to read texts in this way. He doesn't have an interpretive community anymore. And he's, he's trying to teach his people, but in the end, I think he finds that um, he's going to have to liken the scriptures unto them, and he's going to he's gonna have to build something new here. So I, I have come to um, recognize Nephi's sorrow and to recognize the courage that it took for him to be willing to know the things which he knew and then to share them with us the best that he could. That's a really beautiful picture that you paint. And I 100% agree. I feel like I didn't start to really enjoy and appreciate the Isaiah chapters of second Nephi until I understood how it's a reflection for him on thinking about the tragedy of his own people. It's a lot of excoriating Israel for their wickedness and their destruction, but Nephi is including it in a lot of ways because he sees his own people in that. And it's tragic to him and he never sees the fruition of the hopeful promises uh, but at the end of the Book of Mormon, you get just a tiny little hint of that hope when Moroni um, is concluding it in chapter 10, and he's alluding back to some verses of Isaiah where he's saying, Arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, or daughter of Zion, and put on thy beautiful garments. And in the Isaiah chapters, initially, the, uh, the daughter of Zion is... Um, is uh, ashamed and she's uh, ravished and she's destroyed and it's a very shameful picture and that's reflective of the Nephite status but then at the very end Moroni kind of just says we know our people were destroyed it didn't end up the way we were really hoping but we know that ultimately beyond our lifetimes beyond our eon even there will be a redemption for Israel and it's going to come you know in the latter days, it's going to come when the gospel is preached to them and our words finally reach our descendants again through the Lamanites, through the restoration of the gospel. And it's this idea that the daughter of Zion is going to be redeemed, just not in any of the ways that we thought it was. And it's it's tragic and it's heartbreaking and it really moves me when I read those passages. But it's it's hopeful because now it's on us as um, latter day Israel, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, to then try to share that and to give that redemption for the sad and sorrowing Nephi and for the sad and sorrowing Moroni. 
Oh, I love that. That we can, our, our, our gratitude for what Nephi has given us um, can be expressed in the way that we value and share uh, the work that he made possible. Jasmine, we're coming here towards the wrapping up time of our interview. I wanted to talk briefly about one more very special publication. This is called Approaching the Tree. Interpreting First Nephi 8. This is a brand new publication of the Maxwell Institute, hot off the presses, um, and it was edited by three wonderful scholars, Benjamin Keogh, who is a young theologian in Scotland, Joseph Spencer, who has uh, shown up here abundantly already today, and Jennifer Champeau, who is a scholar of art history. What is so special about this book is that it is a book of essays, eight essays, all of them interpreting First Nephi 8, interspersed with original commissioned artworks depicting Lehi's dream. Um, we have artworks by J. Kirk Richards, by Annie Poon, by Megan Guileman, and there's also a wonderful review essay where Jenny Champeau reviews um, the, the history of artistic representations of Lehi's dream. Here's a, here's a wonderful one by Rose Daytok Dahl. So it's just a beautiful book for one thing, but it demonstrates something really important, which is that one thing that makes scripture different from other kinds of writing is that it is especially rich interpretively. Now, all writing is subject to multiple interpretations. That's just the way the written word works, right? We write something down, we send it out of its context, somebody else reads it in a whole different context, and they can't ask us what we meant. So it's, it's subject to being interpreted in different ways by readers. But with scripture in particular, um, because it is our canon, because we recognize it as having a kind of religious and spiritual authority over us and speaking the divine word with God's voice, that makes it um, especially rich and fertile for interpretation. So an important point that I hope readers leave our interview today with is not that, well, I think that Hardy was right and Spencer was wrong, or I think that Reynolds was wrong and so-and-so was right. I hope it's clear that there are multiple interpretations that are um, um, available and enlightening of the same passage of Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that anything goes, right? There are definitely some interpretations that are ruled out. We have to work within the parameters of, of what is written um, and what is true, as you said earlier. Um, nevertheless, Scripture gives itself to us individually as a site for personal revelation. Um, and so it will um, yield interpretive fruits of all different kinds and varieties. Um, and that is okay. And that is right. So there's no sense in which here we're searching for the one, the one single true interpretation or the one single true approach with scripture in particular. Um, more is good. So I would, um, I would encourage listeners to pick up this book. I have an essay in it where I, where I talk about, um, <laughs> What happens if you read Lehi's dream in two different contexts? This is kind of a, um, an outside-in approach. Um, if you read it in one context, um, in, in a biblical intertextual context, then a certain theological picture emerges. If you read it in a different interpretive context, the context of an early American agrarian farm, the context that the earliest readers of the Book of Mormon would have likely read it and received it, then a different kind of theological picture of, of God emerges. Um, and you'll see that mine is only one of many wonderful uh, theological approaches to Lehi's dream. And in particular, I draw attention, I won't take the time to review it now, but I draw attention to Joe Spencer's introductory essay where he reviews the history of interpretations of First Nephi 8. Um, and he shows how that kind of works as a wonderful case study for understanding the large schools of thought that over, as I said, the past 
50 to 70 years um, we have really opened up the Book of Mormon for us from a kind of historical method, as we talked about, an outside-in contextual method, to a literary method that starts from within the text and works outward, um, to a doctrinal method that uses the Book of Mormon, um, finds verses and moments in the Book of Mormon that illustrate um, doctrinal truths and, and uses as a, as a moment, as a way to teach us doctrinal truths. Finally, to a kind of theological approach that is probably, I think you alluded to this earlier, maybe one of the newer approaches to the Book of Mormon, um, which is very much an inside out, an inside first approach, um, reading the text of Scripture deeply and carefully and in the expectation that there will be um, a variety of interpretive fruits that, um, that yield that are that are harvested from that theological approach to the Book of Mormon. Um, yeah, I, anything? Have you t- taken a look at this book? What do you think of of this? Yeah, volume? so I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I have read some of the papers, and I thought it was really interesting. I thought yours was really fun about taking an approach of an agrarian farm and how that lens changes the picture of the Tree of Life vision, um, because. I tend to be a very traditional, stodgy, like historical, ancient context sort of person. And so in the biblical world, exegesis is the interpretation of, you know, how would the original audience have received this? What was the original intent of that author? And in the biblical world, that means an ancient Near Eastern context. You've got to go outside in. You've got to take outside sources and figure out, okay, what's the context here? Because that's going to influence the interpretation of that original audience and that intention of the author. But the Book of Mormon is such a tricky issue because the authors we believe and hold are ancient, and they're coming from an ancient Near Eastern, maybe ancient American persuasion, but their intended audience is modern. Their intended audience is for us in the latter days, for the descendants of the Lamanites. And so they don't necessarily know what modern culture and context, they don't know how to communicate in that language, but they're trying to. And so in some ways, it's very important for us to also say, okay, well, how would the first audience, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Emma, those scribes that were um, doing, uh, scribing the dictation, how would they have received this? How would the earliest saints who took the printed Book of Mormon in their hands, how would they have maybe interpreted these images and symbols? And how does that change our picture of the tree of life? And does that have interpretive value? And so I think it we could use a lot more of um, how does it fit in a 19th century setting? How would it have been received in a 19th century setting? Um, and we need both approaches to say, okay, what did the authors intend? And then how is it received by the audience? And What's the relationship between those two? Um, I think was really interesting. And as you mentioned with um, with the overview article about uh, the history of the scholarship of First Nephi chapter eight was really instructive. I mean, he clearly is pretty well read on all of the approaches people have taken, and there are many. And I think it is really important to have that context and that background to know where we've been so we know where we're going. If we're going to start a new approach for the Book of Mormon, we probably should make sure it hasn't already been done before because chances are it has. (laughs) I mean, we are still a really young discipline, but there's been a lot of great scholarship done over the last 40, 50 years. And what I think is so remarkable about Book of Mormon studies in particular is how accessible it is. I know we've been talking a lot about some insider baseball when it comes to scholarship, but the level of transparency and accessibility you get with Book of Mormon scholarship is fairly unique in, at least in the biblical studies world, you have to buy very, very expensive volumes and go to archives and libraries to kind of get access to some of the scholarship. Whereas with the Book of Mormon, because Latter-day Saints, um, lay Latter-day Saints have such an avid interest in understanding the sacred text, so much of this is available online for free. You've mentioned the Maxwell Institute and the BYU Scholars Archive has many, many articles freely available online. The um, Book of Mormon Central Archive also has many uh, articles available online, the Interpreter Foundation. Um, There's just so many that want to make this accessible. This isn't about gatekeeping. This is about making it available so that everyone can feast upon the word. And so as part of demystifying the scholarship, um, I'd encourage anyone to look up any of these articles. And with the exception of the printed volumes, like Approaching the Tree and the Brief Theological Introductions, I think everything you can find available for free online somewhere so that you can dive in for yourself and just really um, 
take the Book of Mormon to a new level by diving into some of the scholarship because there are unique insights there and keen eyes that uh, will uncover some of your blind spots you maybe never had considered before. Jasmine, I could not agree more. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, yes, it is my hope throughout this whole interview that everything we've said um, has been intriguing and inviting. Um, and I assure you that if you have a basic familiarity with the Book of Mormon as a Latter-day Saint who has been raised in our culture, um, you can understand this scholarship. Um, and it will add and open your eyes to uh, and make the text new and fresh for you again as we approach it through this year. Um, I hope that what I'm hoping is that these podcast episodes will reinvigorate your own study um, and re uh, reopen your eyes to the treasure that we have in the Book of Mormon. Um, I wanted to conclude here, Jasmine, by each of us just sharing a passage from the book of First Nephi that has um, lifted us, inspired us, um, and strengthened our own personal faith. Would you like to go first, sharing something that is sure. meant? Sure. I, I um, as I was thinking about this, I landed on First Nephi chapter 2, verse 16. Um, this is when they're in the valley of Lemuel and... Um, Nephi is reflecting upon his father's visions and his prophetic calling. And he says that um, I, Nephi, having great desires to know of the mysteries of God, wherefore I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me and did soften my heart that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. Um, and, and I really love that passage because um, it's very inviting. It's very empowering. We think of Nephi as this kind of superhero triumphant character who always does what's right. And he's always, you know, um, just the archetypal good guy, but he didn't always start there. At least that's what this hints. And it always, it started with him with asking God, wanting to know the mysteries of God, wanting to understand what his father did and having that desire to learn is what led him on this journey to arrive where he was when he finally wrote his plates. And and it's an invitation to me to also seek and learn. And there's an aspect of humility to it as well, that because he sought to know the mysteries of God, um, his heart was softened. Usually you might think, oh, if I can know the mysteries of God, I'll have this elite knowledge of God and I'll have this, I'll, I'll be superior because I'll have this insider knowledge of, of God and his revelations. But that's, it has the opposite effect for Nephi. Once he was inducted into the mysteries of God, and God visited him, it resulted in a softening of his heart instead of an elevating of his ego. And it resulted in humility. And I think that that tends to be how it goes for me. The more I, I think I know, the more I learn that I really don't know very much at all. And so um, I really admire Nephi's willingness to humbly seek and to be further humbled by that process. I love that, Jasmine. In our minds, we're definitely uh, moving along the same tracks because the scripture that I chose is very much related. Um, it's First Nephi ten verses eighteen and nineteen, and just as a as a as a brief intro, um, I I had been thinking about the great commandment that um, Christ gives his disciples in the New Testament. Right, he says all of the commandments can be subsumed under two great heads. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So love in the New Testament is the great commandment. And I was thinking about what is the great commandment in, in the Book of Mormon? Is there Can all the individual commandments be subsumed under one overarching imperative? And I think it can. Um, and I think it's the commandment that, again, we see in the, the Sermon on the Mount to ask seek and knock to ask of God that he will reveal his mysteries unto us. And I, so I think that's what we see here in first Nephi 10 verses 18, Acts 17 through 19. I Nephi was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy ghost, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him as well in times of old, as in the time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world, if it so be that they repent and come unto him. For he that diligently seeketh shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them. 
by the power of the Holy Ghost, as well in these times as in times of old, and as well in times of old as in times to come. Wherefore, the course of the Lord is one eternal round. So it seems to me that the great commandment of the Book of Mormon is to ask, seek, and knock for the new thing that God is doing in the world. God has called a new prophet in Lehi and in Nephi. He has given them new prophecy. He has given them new scripture. The Liahona, in this beautiful way, symbolizes with the overriding, with the words that the new words that would appear on the Liahona, it symbolizes the way that God's word is always coming to us refreshed and renewed. He's given them a new land, new nourishment in the wilderness. And more than anything, he's given them a new revelation of himself, a new revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. It seems to me that these are the mysteries that both in the passage that you chose and in this one, that Nephi is open to knowing. He is open and is faithful and is diligently seeking for the new things that God is doing in the world. And it seems like this is what Laman and Lemuel can't ever quite get their mind around. They believe in God and they believe in past prophecies, but they can't quite believe that God is doing a new thing in the world now and that he's inviting them to ask, seek, and knock um, to come into new and fresh and personal relation with him. So I find those, I've, I have found those verses newly rich um, and newly inspiring in my own ongoing journey to ask, to seek, and to knock at the door of God. That's beautiful. I really love that take. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jasmine, um, for being with us today. I think this was uh, an invigorating and exciting um, romp through Book of Mormon scholarship on First Nephi. Thank you so much for your expertise, for your great communication skills, and for your testimony. 